Right, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you. And I can just sort of share with you, this, even since I wrote these slides, like, um, things keep moving very quickly. It's almost as, as fast as what's going on in the government, I suppose. Um, so um, on Tuesday, um, we were asked to go to uh, meet the Food Standards Agency in DEFRA to talk about, uh, obviously, Natasha's law. Um, and they wanted to know what our thoughts were on behalf of the, of the hospitality industry. Um, now they are, they are narrowing this down uh, very much just for the pre-packed foods for direct sale. So that's for the, the typical prep situation. So they're not, they were not interested really in talking about anything else other than that scenario. So it's where people are making food on site and packing it um, and there was even some discussion about if, it, if the package could actually be, um, if the food could be removed from the package without the package being damaged, then that might be uh, further exempted. And we felt, well, actually, you know, really, um, there, there's a point where we've come, uh, haven't we learned enough lessons um, not to have these sorts of exemptions? So from UK Hospitality's point of view, we had a food experts group meeting prior to that um, meeting at the FSA DEFRA, and um, we gathered information from members, uh, Brett are actually all of our members, um, and we felt that it's, um, you, you'll be pleased to hear this, that we're, we're in line with what you're, you're saying, the minimum really is, a, is an ask sticker on all packaging, um, regardless of whether it's got an open end or not, so, you know, really, um, we need to engage in dialogue, and um, I feel very, very strongly that unless there is a dialogue, there could be mistakes. I do not want full allergy labeling on uh, allergen labeling on sandwiches in these situations because I think it stops people having the dialogue and it doesn't cover all the other things that might be in that food that people are allergic to or contamination issues. And I think it's better to say this food might contain an allergen. Please ask if you've got a food allergy. And what we actually think is there ought to be some standard wording so that everybody uses the same thing on whatever colour sticker they happen to want to have. Um, so that we're all clear, we're all doing exactly the same thing and the cost of a sticker is absolutely negligible. And I'm sure nobody would want to be in the situation that Pret have been in and, and that we had a speaker from Pret um, talking to us on Tuesday and you know your heart goes out to them as much obviously as to the family of this the way this has happened. So that's where we're standing at the moment, um, but at the same time, we have previously been asked to uh, put together some allergen guidance. So um, I've just recently uh, completed an acrylamide guide for uh, UK Hospitality, which is a tool for our members and also available to everybody. Um, and they sort of thought, well, we'll, we'll have a stake Lisa really, really um, to, to lead a stakeholder group to write an allergen. Um, guidance document. So um, we've started this sort of thought process anyway, um, but they've put that on hold for the moment because they're focusing on this uh, legislative change. And of course one of the other things to say is that there's plenty of legislation available, and always has been, to deal with allergies um, and, uh, and for accidental or deliberate uh, adulteration of food. That's been there since about 1860, and it's, uh, it, it's taken everyone a little bit of a, a while to, to actually uh, use it. So, we've got uh, this allergen guide at the moment, which we're calling, calling the interim allergen guidance, because um, we had a BHA, when, when before UK Hospitality came about, there were, there were two companies, ALR and BHA, which merged. The BHA had uh, an allergen toolkit which they used um, and we thought, oh, we'll put it on the new website and then I, I thought, I really ought to have another look at that. So we have revised it and we've called it the uh, interim allergen guidance because we know that there will be more work to do on this with other stakeholders um, so we can call it our totality wide document. The five key factors that we feel are important um, are that, um, that, that, that you need to know where you're getting your food from. The supplier product information is obviously so critical for you. What was really scary in the meeting on Tuesday with the other experts in hospitality was that a lot of people were saying that they were not getting accurate information from their suppliers. 
particularly where there's a third party involved. Um, so the, uh, the person manufacturing the food could be way down the <coughs> chain. There could be many people handling the food before it actually gets to um, the food business. So uh, if you think you're quietly confident that you're buying from a major supplier, um, just think a little bit again about how good they are at actually um, making sure that they are being supplied food with accurate information and traceability for that matter. Because it was quite an eye opener listening to people commenting um, about how they've had to um, revise their opinion of their due diligence in relation to their supply chain. Now, obviously, if you get the wrong information in, it's going to get worse coming going forward. Your guests are going to get the wrong information, um, and of course, that could be catastrophic. Mm. The other things, obviously, are kitchen and service practices, and that's probably teaching you know, telling Granny to suck eggs because, of course, you've all demonstrated that you've got allergen uh, management systems in place. But I would say, uh, as a practitioner, it's always a good idea to review your systems very regularly and, of course, learn from cases and, and, and tragedies and make use of those to actually make improvements to your system. I try to think what would happen if um, things went terribly wrong when I was in court. What, well, how would I defend the business? What sort of information would I need? And what if? Well, all those what ifs. If only I'd done that. Uh, and so sometimes it's actually quite a good idea to have a think about um, almost challenging yourself with that sort of thing. Imagine if someone had bought something and had an allergic reaction. How would I prove that I actually had you? So don't just rely on the static documentation, but also think about what would you do and have a bit of a run through, a bit like a fire drill, but one for, for food safety or allergy. You can go and miss from time to time. Now, another thing I'll just mention as well on the supplier side of things is that sometimes the data may not be accurate. And one of the things that we discussed on Tuesday was um, some of the problems with companies doing what's called data scraping. So where they basically are looking at your website without your permission and taking the data off it about allergens and then putting it into an app that people are using. And more and more people are using these types of apps. You need to be obviously very careful about that because anything that, if your website's not up to date, then that data won't be up to date either. So some companies have actually banned people from doing that and will supply them instead with up-to-date APIs so that they can actually get the current live data within minutes of it being changed. Because if we are, food is a commodity, it's not, it's not something, you know, we've got to be realistic about this and there's always going to be somebody trying to substitute or make something cheaper and make more money out of it. And that, of course, leaves allergy, allergic people very vulnerable to changes in the supply chain. So just be aware that these, this data scraping thing could be going on and make sure um, that you are protected as well. Um, and that's particularly important for young people because they would probably rather look at a nap than ask a question of the staff who actually know better. So um, uh, that's uh, another worry. So in terms of managing cross-contamination, this is why I, I'm particularly in, interested in um, avoiding having too much allergen information on the actual menu uh, because I think people need to tell you if they have an allergy. Because they could choose an item on the menu that doesn't have that allergen in, but you as the person preparing the food wouldn't know that that guest had, had an allergy to something that wasn't actually in that meal but might have been made on the same chocolate board and so on. So you can imagine the scenario. Now, that also brings me to a point which I feel is very important, and that is, if at all possible, and if you're in the situation and you've got the time, why not ask your guests when you put them at the table, have you got any dietary information I need to be aware of? You can ask it in all sorts of nice ways, it doesn't have to upset the flow of things, but just saying, does anybody here have an allergy? Does anyone here have a, a, a preference even? I know you might think, oh, that's a pain in the neck. You're going to get all these 25% of people who don't really have an allergy saying stuff. But wouldn't you rather have that than someone drop dead because they, um, they've been too scared to ask? And in particular, it's these young adults who really are frightened to, to pipe up, but might just pipe up if you give them the opportunity. 
Now, so I, I went to the party of people to a Paul Ainsworth restaurant not long ago, and when I made the booking, they said, have you got any dietary requests that you need us to know about? And I was going, no, no, I don't think so, I don't think so. Anyway, we, we turned up at the restaurant, and then they asked again, and it turned out that one member of the party had uh, quite a severe fish allergy. Um, and of course, because it asked twice, this actually came out loud. Um, and she is, wasn't particularly good at, at um, telling people about it because it's, it's quite new for her and she wasn't... And, and of course it was a fish restaurant, <laughs> which was not perhaps the best choice for her. Um, but uh, there were, of course, dishes without fishing, but had <coughs> fish ingredients which we didn't know about. So, great practice. Guest care, that's what hospitality is all about, is talking to your guests and getting them to tell you if they, if they have a special request. And, particularly as I say for, for young adults, or well, even old farts like me, you know, you still need to be reminded that, um, uh, to, to tell people, because restaurateurs are not mind readers. The training we've, we've sort of covered, training's really important, what does, it, what does it do, does it really mean, does it make a behavioural change, that's what I'm interested in, do the front of staff, they're the key gatekeepers, do they really know how to deal with, with the customers um, and are they actually going to ask those vital questions right up front and pull that information out of the guests. I think little and often is better for training of this nature than a sit down course, let's have everybody you know, in the room for six hours. Um, I, I also think experimenting with um, e-learning on mobile apps and so on is, is probably quite good for refresher training to just, just keep people on the board. Now, and, and as I said, the good communication. This is, communication is just what it's all about. So communication is not just between the guests um, and, uh, and the front of house staff, but it's all the way through. So it's, it's really necessary to make sure you've got the right information, um, that you, you flag it up and that information carries through with the dish, um, and that someone else is sense checking. If you've got an electronic system, now and again do sense check it, because if someone has put something in wrong, it will be wrong. If someone has forgotten, and I've seen electronic systems where they've forgotten to put fish in a fish finger or something like that, you know, and you can, it sometimes needs a human. And we used to, when I used to run a company, we used to do this sort of work, and we always sense checked um, the data. And I know that's a huge responsibility and a huge task, but it was amazing how many times we actually used to find Hours, very obvious hours. And it's really important then that that information is available to be passed on to the guest. And we know that guests don't necessarily want to be given the great big folders as soon as they walk into the menu. Um, and it's, it's really been able to guide them and give them that trust, as Lynn um, has said. So, what about some of these more unusual situations the rack foods, the buffets, the conferences, the foods for meetings? Um, these are situations which can catch you out very easily. How do you actually make sure that people know what is in the food that they're eating? How do you make sure that you display the right information? Now, I'm really worried about little signs on food saying what's in them because people move them around. Customers are not very good at being, behaving themselves, really. And I mean, recently I went into a prep to get a cheese sandwich and I, I got on the train and started munching into a ham sandwich because somebody had moved that ham sandwich into the cheese section. So this is very important. You know, you can't, just because you put it out beautifully doesn't mean to say it stays like that. You know what the customers are like. You know, they rummage around and don't fancy that and then put it somewhere else. So is it better then in those situations to not actually put the labels on the food, but to put a label saying, if you have an allergy, please ask. I think it is because it's safer. And again, it captures all those other allergens that people might have and the cross-contamination thing. So the same thing for food for meetings and for conferences. So just as I was saying, what people do to food, moving it around, but also on buffets, they've got tongs everywhere, and sometimes um, you know, it's better if there's a buffet situation and you know that there's an allergic person coming to actually give them a plate of food with some cling film over the top and then you know, they know that that's safe. It's not going to get um, somebody else putting the wrong tongs into the wrong thing and so on. Um, so again, it's a question of asking up front if you're having a, a meeting or a conference, is there anyone coming who has an allergy? And then 
making sure the stickers are on there as well. The, the twice uh, asking is very important when someone's making a booking. Don't, don't just assume because they've said on the booking about something, it's that second asking that's, that's very important as well. So, I mean, I have to talk as well about what chefs can do to the food um, because they will be touching it, they will be using equipment, um, they'll be touching one food and then the other, they'll be washing up and cleaning. If they don't know what the, they've got an allergic guest who needs to be protected from contamination, all this stuff will be going on regardless of what it actually, what, what the ingredients are in the different foods. So do think about up and house. This is why it brings me back to the point that if you have an opportunity to ask the guests if they're allergic to anything, that really does help because it means you can then go back up house and really focus on what, um, what you're doing in terms of cross-contamination. So the, um, the allergen uh, interim advice at the moment is downloadable uh, free for members of UK hospitality and as I say we will be uh, building up something much bigger with the Food Standards Agency and other stakeholders in due course. I just thought I'd um, give you a couple of uh, allergen hours. I've had to trim this down because I was only around 15 minutes, so I've got loads more, loads more. I mean, it's, uh, it's really quite crazy. Um, and um, the first one is the allergen corner. Oh, that absolutely drives me to <laughs> Because, I mean, it's beautiful, isn't it? God, wouldn't you just die from a dry store like that? But people, I mean, I'm doing an inspection of the food process and they, they proudly take me into this area. I was in a, an airline. Um, Okay, so you've got 14 allergens, and they're all in the same cage together. <laughs> Fantastic! I don't need to go on, do I? Oh, that one, that was a good one. I don't know whether you would have sold any of those, but you know, the allergen crash kit, everything purple, because purple is allergen. So all 14 allergens go on the purple board. That's a good one. And somebody probably made quite a lot of money out of that. <coughs> Sorry, that's blurred. That's probably a good thing. Um, but basically, the label, in fact, that's as good as you could get anyway reading that, probably, unless, unless you, you speak Mandarin. Um, but, you know, if the label's not in English, it's legal anyway. But how on earth do you know what the allergens are in that food? And I, I actually I took that photo in a pub. Uh, what's in the dish? You find stuff that when I'm doing an inspection, find stuff like that with the whisk in it as well, in, in the fridge. Who knows what it is? The person who made it might have gone home, might have been sat out and might have um, you know, decided they don't want to come to work anymore, whatever. They're not there, you can't ask them, and you've got this stuff in there. Who knows if an allergic person comes in and says, has that got egg in it? You would not know. <coughs> Electronic systems. As I mentioned, beware what goes in, must, you know, must be good. If you have rubbish going in, it's rubbish coming out. Substitution. Now, this, this actually happens. Tomato ketchup is not all the same. And it's the same for lots of things. They're made, they're sometimes made in different countries. <coughs> so your supplier may fall short of some tomato ketchup and decide, well, I'll go and get it from Canada instead. Now, the recipe in Canada is different to here. So someone I know was making some food up, they've run out of tomato ketchup, they're making a tartar sauce. And so what they did instead of, um, sort of well, they just took a sachet and uh, used that, and it is a different recipe. So one's got celery and one hasn't. So it's really important that you think you're doing the right thing, but be, even though it's called Heinz tomato ketchup, it may not be the same. And that's the same for a, a lot of other foods too. More communication issues I just wanted to raise. Um, kids, I've got three young adults, um, they don't want to engage, they get embarrassed, um, and they don't really want to look through folders. So Lynn mentioned the Easy to Ask campaign. It's actually really difficult to find this on the Food Standards Agency website. I think I'm quite good at Google, but it's really difficult to, <laughs> difficult to find that picture. Um, and it, it's so important. There should have been much more emphasis of it. We, we need it to be um, in your face. And, it, and I think actually it would be nice if there was something which everybody could use. Um, and going on to your point about the food hygiene rating scheme, 
Um, I'm a member of the uh, expert group for regulating our future and we are discussing food hygiene rating and UK hospitality is also um, feeding evidence into um, the, the discussions that are being held about the food hygiene rating scheme right this right minute. And um, we, agree, we agree, and certainly the Food Standards Agency are on board with that. They are now saying they want to see standards, including allergens, in food hygiene rating. So you have probably got your own way there because it's, you know, this is, it has, but it's happening. And it's only right because people would think a five meant that they were safe to eat there. Um, but there are, you know, there are all these other things about the customer being in a hurry and can't be bothered to, to ask and the customer might be drunk and, you know, it's, all these things are very, very difficult. Have a think about what your typical customer is. And also have a think about how big your, sign, your signage is. Because um, the other day I was, I was having a little rummage around, designing what I do as well. And I was in a pub and the menu had minuscule writing about allergens at the bottom of the menu in quite a dark pub, busy pub probably in the evening. There was a drinks menu with the same thing. It's really not good enough. It needs to be in your face. Imagine you were in the situation where you have killed somebody because they didn't ask, because they didn't see the sign. And a lot of people don't realise that drinks contain allergens. They have Worcester sauce, which has got fish in it, if it's a Bloody Mary. They have celery salt in it. They have egg white and so on. So think about where you can put your allergy sign at point of sale in a bar, in a busy bar. It's hard, isn't it? It's quite hard. Uh, but maybe it's at the till, maybe it's when they come to pay, but really it should be before they actually make that decision to buy. And certainly not in tiny, tiny font at the bottom of the menu. And then to add insult to injury on that same menu, um, they had a little N next to some of the, the foods, which is actually also on my room 101 for allergy handlers. So you choose which allergens you're going to promote and highlight, but not everything. How dangerous is that? So everyone would go, well, it's got N for nuts, so it has not E for eggs, so it must be fine. How confusing. We have to make sure that we make it really easy for our guests. Just imagine if everything went horribly wrong, how would you explain your way out of that situation? And then you can start thinking back to how you can put very, very simple things in place to make sure that people um, don't get an allergic reaction. We have in UK Hospitality a group within our organisation who are clubs. And that's not dissimilar to those of you who might have schools or other places where you get regular guests. And the problem with this is um, they've told you once that they're allergic to something and they think you'll remember forever. Wow, that is so scary, isn't it? Because of course it's not going to be the same front of house person every time. Um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily going to be the same chef. The menu could have changed. So it's a difficult situation. You don't want to say every time, tell me if you've got an allergy, because the guy would go, I've told you 300 times already, and you can imagine you know, if it's a stuck shirt. You'd get very, very angry about that. But on the other hand, if they, uh, if they sell them something that has got an allergy in, then it's catastrophic. So this, this is something to, to think about. How do you manage that? How do you manage it in schools? Well, sometimes they have pictures of children. Um, uh, at, the, at the serving canteen. Um, the, the, and then the other thing is, of course, if you have wristbands, which some people have tried, then that means that children could feel ostracised and get bullied for it. Or, you know, there's all sorts of difficulties. Um, we're having a lot of these at the moment reported. I don't know if you're getting the same. Where a customer comes in, takes a risk, and then gets an allergic reaction because they haven't told you. So around the one company said 40% of their alert, uh, alleged allergic reactions that occur in the business are from people who didn't tell them that they had an allergy. So that's scary. That, to me, is enough to say, wouldn't it be better to ask first, to, for the server to say, has anybody got an allergy? But um, they've had figures between 32 and 40%, which is really, really quite scary. So, in conclusion then, um, no supply chain. Don't accept substitution. Some companies have 
policies where they will not allow a substitution at all. And then the other ones might have a, a, a policy where if there is a substitution, then someone senior has to approve it. <coughs> Chefs obviously have to take responsibility for what they're making and they need to have no secret ingredients. That was a real challenge about 10, 15 years ago when chefs always had a special sauce bottle that they liked to dribble all over the plate and nobody knew what was in it. But you know, those days are gone. Data has to be accurate and it has to be up to date. Um, training and coaching, little and often, is what I think. It's not a bad idea just as you tell front of house what's on the menu today to also tell them if there's been any change of ingredient, just in case they have a regular customer and they could alert them. Um, it's never guessing that's really important as well. So often people want to please. And that if, if the training does nothing else, and it just says to them every day, don't ever guess. If someone asks you a question, come, come back, this is our policy, come and talk to so and so. That would be a good start. And um, I, I do think asking the customer, I was in a tiny little place the other day in Exeter, um, and it only had about five seats, but it was quite busy, and it did a lot of takeaway. Uh, it's like a Vietnamese uh, restaurant or takeaway place. Every, I sat there because I had to sit down. Every person who came in, she asked the same question. Have you got an allergy? A little tiny place like that managed it. And you know, how good is that? I thought, bravo, you know, because they had got nuts flying around and sesame seeds and all sorts of things. But it was great that she actually took the trouble. And do remember, as we've said, we have said several times, people are allergic to things other than those on the list of 14. So this, um, we are also having coming soon uh, an assured food safety management system for the UK hospitality members, which has got an elegant management system in place. So thank you very much.